Uh, he's the author of Getting Hitched, Rediscovering the Basic Truths of Mutual Attraction, uh, which is what led us to um, invite him here to this conference this weekend. And he holds a JD uh, from the University of Texas Law School, PhD from the University of Dallas, and a BA from Middlebury College. He's also married and has five children. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Upham. Well, good afternoon. Um, this, um, this topic um, in the program is meant to be something a little lighter, um, a little more lighthearted than what we've been discussing thus far, and I hope it will be. Still, I should, I should confess that it is a hard topic uh, for me to discuss, even though I'm, I've done it many times. First, it's hard because I consider myself an academic, a scholarly person, not someone who would be disposed to talking about dating and um, how to look handsome or how to look pretty. Um, and it's hard because the topic is, in some respects, less important than anything discussed here. Lifelong, lo lifelong love, fidelity, society, the common good, is more important than the sub-rational things I'll be discussing um, this afternoon. And it's hard despite the lightness of the topic, despite its subordinate status, it's something that causes people trouble and grief. Almost everyone recognizes that uh, who is interested in a marriage, marriage-minded, or somehow interested in some sort of enduring mutual attachments, that there is something necessary uh, about these sub-rational things. Uh, there's something necessary about at least at the initial stage of mutual attraction. And at the same time, everyone, I think, recognizes that this world of mutual attraction is not a meritocracy. Uh, there's a lot of dumb luck. You just happen to be taller or better looking or more vivacious or more naturally at ease or more confident. And many of these things do not involve anything over which you have any choice or that involve any degree of virtue or not or culpability. It's just you got lucky. Um, indeed, there does seem to be some degree of truth in the lament of the now 40-year-old song. Um, by Janice Ian, where she said, I learned the truth at 17. Love was meant for beauty queens. Right? The Valentines I never knew. Um, despite all of the hardness of the topic, the difficulty of the topic, I think, on, I think in general, a fair look at it uh, will be, for most people, a source of bemusement, and I hope, you'll find, I hope you find human nature funny, um, better get used to it because it's the only nature you got. So you might find some fun in it. Also find it informative and, and, and maybe even encouraging rather than demoralizing. My thesis is that for a variety of reasons, some of them perennial and some of them peculiar to our times, the basic facts of mutual attraction that were once part of the general knowledge called the common sense have become obscure. Despite the candor of our times where we talk about everything, so it seems, there are some things we're not very comfortable talking about, and, in, and it's not only do we meet these topics with silence, but implausible denials, sometimes angry denials. This obscurity impairs our ability to engage in mutual attraction, and therefore the, the mutual attraction necessary to marriage. In this presentation, I aim to rather unchastely take off the veil, take off some of the coverings here, um, and tell the truth with candor, but I hope with some good humor and some sensitivity. Although these facts are somewhat disappointing or hard, I think on, on the, in the whole they are hopeful. I should, add, I, do not assume, I should add that I do assume here that there are a few of you who might be marriage-minded, or even if not, you know a few people, some of your friends are. Um, and I should further add, that the claims I'm making here are not absolute universals. When I say, for instance, that women generally like taller men, I do not dispute the possibility that there may be some women for whom smallness of size is not only tolerable, but preferable, if not an absolute priority. I must confess I've never met such a woman, but I do I'm not going to say there is no such woman who does not insist on five feet or under. Okay. I'm, I'm going to proceed in three parts. First, why the obscurity, especially today? Secondly, the hard facts, 
have the vegetables first, and I hope the hopeful facts, which will be a much more uh, pleasant uh, dessert. Yes, vegetables are bad and unpleasant. <laughs> I don't believe people who say they like them. Okay. First, why the obscurity? Some old reasons and some new reasons. The old reasons why we don't, um, where human beings are uncomfortable talking about these basic facts um, are many, but one of them st stands out, especially in our culture, deeply, um, deeply influenced by Judaism and Christianity. And that is that those religions tend to say that those facts should not be given much significance. For instance, for thousands of years, a pious young man might read something like the following, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And that pious young man might internally, with some guilt, say to himself, look, I'm all good with fear of the Lord, but can I get a little bit of beauty and charm too? Just a little bit, is that okay, God? No, it's vain and unpleasant. So too, the pious young woman might read something like the following, Blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor. And she might say to herself internally, that's true, that's wonderful, I like that. I will pray for them, but I'm going to marry that guy on horseback. Okay. The beggar in the ditch is the object of my pity, but not my marital affection. But in our times, there's a special reason for the obscurity, a special reason for the denials. There's Alexis de Tocqueville, um, one of my favorite commentators and one of the most renowned commentators on the American, uh, American democratic society. And he emphasized that in democratic times, especially in America, that equality wasn't simply a moral or legal principle, but was a passion. In a democratic society, he said, people have a love for equality that is ardent and even tenacious. The love is the principal passion, he says. Indeed, the singular and dominant in fact in, egalitarian, in democratic times we love equality, he said. Not only is equality closely related to justice, but equality gives us a variety of daily easy pleasures. In his words, every day, equality provides a multitude of little delights to everyone. And as, as a result of this general and um, frequent availability of its delights, egalitarian passion is both energetic and general, pervading the whole society. What are the pleasures of living in a society free from, from at least formal aristocracy. First, equality is less annoying. When you get in line uh, to get some coffee at, at, at Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts, second is better, um, you, you don't have to get defer to anyone with a puffy shirt, some pompous lady, or some dude who says, well, my SAT scores are better than yours. You're not better than me. We like that. Second, Equality is easier in complex aristocratic hierarchical societies. There are lots of rules as to how you address people. Multiple forms of you, tutoyer, vous voyez, and many languages have more than just two. And different ways in which you're supposed to bow to this person as opposed to that person, and who you let first, and who you let second. In democratic times, it's all the same. Hi, I'm Dave. And sometimes just one syllable, sup. Very e easy. The, the rules of social, social, social uh, interactions are easy. And finally, equality is friendlier. Hierarchical societies create distance between castes, between levels. People in one caste can be noble, they can be generous, they can be courteous, but they cannot be pals with people in the other castes. Breaking down caste systems allows, seems to allow at least, an extension of that kind of the virtue of hanging out and being cool with other people. How does equality give us a blindfold, however? Well, it makes us uncomfortable thinking about certain stubborn and perennial facts that are not equal. Um, it makes us displeased with them and makes, it, makes us uncomfortable even reflecting on them in ways in which they might be relevant to our lives. Luck, in matters of love, luck, whether genetic or otherwise, seems to play a big part. It seems to matter whether you're good looking or not, intelligent or not, rich or not, et cetera, et cetera. In democratic times, we respond not only by silence, but in our time, by a, by, a, by a number of what I would call just denials, famous river in Africa. And the denial take many forms, and I'll just give a few that I've heard over the years. First, oh, 
mutual attraction, it's all a mystery, a magical, obscure mystery, and you can never predict anything. Or everyone's equal. Equal, equal, I say, equally beautiful. Shut up, <laughs> okay? And don't say anything further. Have you ever seen George Clooney? And take a look at me. <laughs> and just please, be, I appreciate your silence, okay? Third, personal denial. Oh, others are superficial, but I'm not. I don't care about such things. The, the, the writer Marcel Proust once said, oh, let men, let, let us leave pretty women to men without imagination. Okay. <laughs> I'll trade in my imagination. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> What's so bad about denial? Why, why are you so judgmental? Um, science and, and, and denial especially is problematic if the knowledge of the relevant facts is helpful to something you'd like. If you are interested in pursuing mutual attraction and lifelong mutual, attra mutual uh, attachments, it's helpful. It's helpful first in knowing what to do. Maybe there are some things that aren't simply about a matter of height, but things that do involve possibly some matter of change. Bending a little bit to please uh, your prospective husband or wife. Second, it's helpful to know simply to understand and manage your own desires. You may want to ask, hey, why am I always doing X? Why am I attracted to women like this or men like this? Is it here? Is it, or is it sub-rational, something here? And just to, just to be aware how it affects you. Third, and I think perhaps most importantly, a failure to face these facts means that the facts are there and they linger in our peripheral vision, if, as, as it were. And they linger as kind of a shadow, something that seems perhaps difficult or ominous, where you start to wonder, what does the opposite sex want from me? Do they want something totally unrealistic? One of my friends once said, you men, all what you want is uh, supermodel and Mother Teresa wrapped into one. Or do they, they want Mr. Darcy, um, tallest, richest, and most confident man in the room. No, 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 I'm none of those. Okay, well, I guess I've got nothing to offer. Or, or even worse, are they, are they looking for something strange or foreign, harmful, exploitative from me? Do they want, they want to do bad things? I don't, and I think that has a deep effect on mutual mistrust between the sexes. If, however, the truth is less bad than our fears, it's very helpful to look at it, even if it isn't perfect. So let's take a look. Start with the, so yeah, sounds, the, the title, the uh, cover page of my book was designed to show that kind of, the two ends of the, of the, um, of the bench looking at each other like, I kind of like you, but what, the, what do you want from me? Okay. All right, the hard facts. Before even looking at the asymmetries between the sexes, and I very much uh, appreciate um, uh, the, the previous lectures about this and, and, this, and discussing the asymmetries, we must recall the radical, radical equality of men and women, and the radical equality, for that matter, of the whole human race. Everyone in the whole human race comes from male and female. Okay? Even those who say male and female is a social construct, they are a male and female construct. Okay? The entire human race, that is the place of Authenticity, perfect equality, there are no exceptions. Okay. And every male comes from a long, unbroken succession of females. And every female comes from a long, unbroken succession of males. I am just as much, and everyone in this room is just as much, a father and a son to his father and mother as his, uh, as his sister is. So, anyway, I'm messing it all up there, but you get what I mean, okay? I am no less a son to my mother than my sister is a daughter to my mother. We are not from Mars and Venus, okay? We come from the exact same place. And we've been doing this dance for thousands and thousands of generations. Um, our bodies are probably inclined to the same place. Here, I, know, I do know there are exceptions. I don't, I don't want to say there aren't. But it's not surprising that they are few in number. It's not surprising that the vast majority of human beings have bodies that, that seem to be able to, hearts that do seem inclined, to engage in the very thing that made everybody, that is to say, bonding, reproduction, and, most important, the extensive education that homo sapiens need. Okay? If we were bears, hookups and single motherhood is how it's done. Totally appropriate, nothing scandalous. Human beings require something more than baby bears. Rousseau was wrong, just 
quite wrong, okay? <laughs> totally wrong. Um, that work is not easy, but very hard, and I'll return to that many times. Okay? The work of, ultimately, the fulfillment of that male-female thing is not simply making the baby, it is getting all the way so that you get people like you. And ask your parents whether it was easy to make you. The compilation may have been easy. The rest of it, lots of sweat. And it's thousands of generations of people somehow dragging or bringing these tiny, vulnerable, helpless things up to being walking and talking and male-female uh, producing and educating human beings. It's, I mean, it's just amazing that we're here. When you realize how what a pain we are to get here, what a pain we've been, okay? <laughs> but there's a radical inequality between men and women. Right where everything looks so equal, right where everything looks so, we're all in this together, we've got that great divergence. Mother Nature puts stars on thars and not on thars. You know that from the Dr. Seuss book about racism. Well, in this case, those stars make a big difference. Men get women get pregnant and men don't. And that produces at least three radical inequalities that our, that our species has to deal with. First, burden of offspring. Women experience a much higher burden of, of the effects of, of uh, babies, both, in fact, even before pregnancy. Okay? I, they're, they're very, women tend to have um, the monthly cycles, everything, and then pregnancy, and then postpartum, and then it's, it's just not fair. It isn't. I, I didn't, you know, somebody else did it. I didn't do it, I promise. Okay? Number of offspring. This produces a peculiar thing. Women can only have a few. Men conceivably could have thousands. Okay? And this produces a, a, a divergence in an issue. And a third one, not mentioned in the last session, but I'm going to emphasize it here because it's really not mentioned, but I think it's massive. Men don't know who their offspring are. How would they know? Well, we'll talk about that later on. So if they want to be in the business of raising their own offspring, they've got one, women have one advantage that men don't have. Okay. What do women want? By the way, before I go further, this is not something I cooked up in the manosphere. I did write this book. I had two women editors. I had multiple women read through and, and the, the notes on which this book is based. If I'm wrong, I'm going to blame them. If someone says, you don't understand women at all, I've had plenty of women tell me that, and, and help me refine this, okay? Um, first, every woman in this room has this in her ancestry, okay? The terrible burdens of children, the fear that they're just going to die in her arms, okay? That is not necessarily here. I'm talking about the sub-rational thing, okay? I want you to take a look at that picture. Every, don't forget it. Gentlemen, don't forget it. It'll help you understand a lot. Okay. What does she need? Help. Okay. Again, if she were a bear, it wouldn't be a problem. This is how, this is how bear, mama bears do this all the time. And they don't look out in the world stressed out. Human beings are difficult, unlike bears. That's the magic formula, gentlemen. Kindness and strength. Someone who's got resources and is going to be nice about it. Okay. Kindness alone won't do it. The bitter nice guy doesn't get this, and I'll talk about him more in the future. Okay. Kindness is good, but kindness isn't going to help her unless it's substantial unless it brings resources to bear. What types of resources do men have? In, not just today, but in the history of the human race on this earth. They have physical strength. They might have a position in the society. They might be rich. They might have promise, which is indicated by their confidence. If, you're, if you have all of these strengths rolled up into one, you're Mr. Darcy, okay? I love Jane Austen, and I relied upon her very much in writing the book. She tells the truth. And among other things, why is it that Mr. Darcy is, the, is universally in the room the handsomest man in the room? He's the tallest. He's got that noble mien. He's got a swagger. And once it's found out how much money he's got, 
He is universally, until he becomes a jerk about it, then he, he takes the kindness out. Right. Um, again, there may be women for whom none of these things are any matter whatsoever to them. Okay. Zero. Absolutely zero interest. But I haven't met them. Um, these are all hard truths. I know that. Okay. But if you're poor, unconfident, and short, well, you better get, you better get used to the friend zone. Because you're, you're not going to get anywhere. I'll talk more about this in a little bit. I've got, don't leave, okay, in despair or anger, because I've got the hopeful stuff coming. But you need to face this first. It's even worse. Women seem to not just like strength of some sort, and there's multiplicities of them, but exceptional strength. They do so by comparison. So Mr. Knightley in Emma, when does he flip the switch inside Emma's mind? It's when he's standing there among the stoop-shouldered and old men, and as Jane Austen says, he could not have appeared to better advantage because he had weaklings around him. He looks better by comparison. I thought we weren't supposed to compare people. Well, I think those rules get broken on a regular basis. Um, it's even worse, and this is, this is a, a uh, it's even worse than that. The average man, simply in his averageness, doesn't seem to be an object of affection, and it's not the same the other way. The average, what is, who is the average man in the United States of America? He's five foot nine, he's about 20 to 25 pounds overweight, he probably makes about $30,000 a year, and he's got a high school degree and maybe some college. Does that sound like someone who would find his way into the cover of a romance novel? Okay. Here's the great sex divide, and I'll talk more about it on the men's side in a little bit. Men are on a dimmer switch. If you're a woman that even looks like she might be close to fertile age, just simply being yourself, you are an object of some interest to young men. Or for young, young men. But if you're a young man, just some average dude, that switch is probably in the off position. I was open, my eyes were open to this several times, but there was one anecdote that makes me laugh every time I think about it. I was in uh, um, graduate school, I was in Europe with a bunch of uh, Americans, and we were in a mixed conversation. And some of the gentlemen, I thought very inappropriately, were discussing how lovely that we were in Poland, these Polish girls were. And so I thought, I thought, okay, this needs to end, and I'll, I'll, I'll do it by, you know, by saying, well, you know, asking the ladies to, to comment on, the, on the, the handsomeness of Polish women. We're in a city, by the way, so lots of people. And one or two of the women said, well, you know, I really haven't seen anybody to turn my head. And I just, my jaw just dropped on the floor. I see someone who's going to turn my head like every 10 seconds. I mean, you simply don't find anyone of interest? Your world is strange to me. That song, all, standing, again, standing on the corner watching all the girls go by, is true of what men think. And it's not true the other way around. And it drives men bonkers. I'll talk more about the nice guy in a minute about this. Okay. And we're supposed to be a democratic society, remember? Everyone's supposed to be equal. But average doesn't seem to do much. Um, this also deeply affects, and I won't be able to get into all of it, the ability of men and women to form, form friendships. Um, men have a difficult time just turning the thing off. Okay. <laughs> it's a difficulty. It's not the same. Okay. Um, I'll get to him in a bit. Um, so yes, in order to understand one phenomenon, and there's many of them, I'd like to talk about something that is, was once a joke, the friend zone. When I, was, when I first heard the word, it was coined in, the, I think, the show Friends. Oh, you're in the friend zone. It was kind of this funny thing. I looked online last few years, and it's just like everyone's mad about it. The men are all bitter about the friend zone. And, like, you, and then the women are like, you're accusing men of any friend zone. I think, I'm going to just guess, I think I know what's going on. And I think I'll try, to, I'll try to demonstrate it by a little short story called The Bitter Nice Guy, okay, in the friend zone. Who is the nice guy in America today? He is the average guy who grew up in systems of coeducation, equality. He's learned, what has he learned? He's learned the right things, 
or most of the right things. He's learned he's supposed to be kind, he's supposed to be, women, women are tired of disrespect, and he should be respectful of them. This type, these type of things are said many, many times. Okay? These words are said. You'll, you, you don't hear much, hey, women like strength. Okay, that's important. But you hear a lot. This makes perfect sense to the nice guy, because he's nice. So you mean to tell me that what women want is niceness. Well, I got that, and I got it in abundance. Now, I didn't say great virtue. These aren't great men. He's just like ordinary, like not being a jerk, okay? And they find out, well, all women are all mad about it, so I'll be the nice guy. There's something else about it. The kind of niceness that he has happy to practice, which involves smiling and attentiveness, is for men very pleasant. <laughs> and he thinks it'll work the same way. If everything he did, a woman did to him, he wouldn't, he'd have to make a decision about what to do with his attractive, attractiveness in front of him. If it was, if that, was, if that person was his best friend's girlfriend or if he was married or something, he would have to do, this woman is attractive because she's smiley and attentive. He would have to do this and lock it up in the friend zone. Men have to consciously construct and segregate things. So because they know it's not right to do otherwise, okay? The thing about it they don't understand is in the minds of some of these the girls that they're being really nice to, they don't have to friend zone them. Mother Nature already friend zoned you, dude. She, you're just weak and feeble, and she doesn't find you attractive, and it's not her decision, okay? Your friend zone would have to be a decision. And so why they get, up, they get upset about it? Because they think, well, you're not attached. You keep telling me you're looking for a guy. I wish I could find a nice guy like you, et cetera. Um, but what about me? <laughs> and so they get all upset. The way to think about it, nice guys, if there are, and I'm sure there's some nice guys in the room. I was one, I get it. Well, I was never really bitter about it. I think I kind of got it. But um, she looks at you the way you would look at like a 70-year-old woman who's your mom's friend who's really nice to you. <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm happy. I, I'm very happy. And you might even say to her, I wish I could find a girl like you. Right? You're like, geez, it, it's all good. I like you're being nice to me, that's great. No, because you, there is no, it's off now, okay? The, your dimmer switch is down to zero when you're a 20 year old boy, okay? Sorry, boy, young man, sorry, excuse me. Okay. Um, don't be bitter. You wanna be bitter at something, blame nature. Like Hephaestus in uh, Odysseus, in, in, the, in the Odyssey, when his, when his wife cheats on him. He doesn't say, he does say she was wrong to cheat on him, but he doesn't blame her for wanting, liking Ares more than him. He's a cripple and he's got racer's legs. And he says, I just blame my, I should have never been born. <laughs> it's kind of bitter, but at the same time, at least you're not blaming the wrong person because she didn't make the choice to like Aries more. She didn't have any choice in that, in, in those type of affections. Not to, she had the choice about committing adultery, but that's a different question. All right. Um, now, what about the men folk? Do they have anything predictable about them? <laughs> Is there anything about men that seems to fall into rather predictable sequence, or are they just interested in spiritual things? I swear I'm not making this up. I read, I read a, an article written by a man for, for a women's magazine about what he was interested in. He said, you know what I really like in women? It's a woman with strong opinions. I almost just fell off my chair laughing. I said, dude, you are such a pander. It makes me, make, come on, okay? Tell the truth here, man. You might like strong opinions, but those are accessories. They're not wardrobe basics, okay? In what you're interested in attraction. So what about these dudes? We're all like this. No, we're actually not. But <laughs> Hold on. Um, remember, back to our problem. Men can't reproduce themselves. They, they desperately need someone to bear and nurse their offspring. They, can't, they cannot do the very thing that made them unless they get the cooperation of women. Okay? They feel that dependency at a subrational level more than women do the other way. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Okay? They know they're at the periphery of life and they want in on the game. No, and I say, I'm not talking about this part. I'm talking about this part of their, their, their mind. And they need some help. So who can they get help from? They can get help from women who appear to be able to bear children. Okay. It's, it's an interesting thing about bearing children. It's very age dependent. Men's desires tend to be for women between 18 and say 45. And 45 year old women report if they're single, they go back on the dating market and they say, like, it's like it disappeared. And I have some sympathy for them because that was my world when I was 19 and it looked like I was 14. It's you're just like, I don't, I don't exist as an, as an alternative. I mean, I don't exist as an option here. Um, so youth is not unimportant. Moreover, 
There are certain physical features of women, I'm not going to be too blunt about it, that are very closely connected with the desperate needs for, the new, for new life. Rational animals, upright national, rational animals, have big brains in order to be intelligent. They also have big heads. That causes trouble that other species don't have. Okay? That's why men are interested in that part of the body. The next, going further up. Men would rather the offspring be theirs rather than somebody else. So if you have a waistline that suggests you're pregnant, um, I, that's less interesting. I, I'm totally not scandalizing anybody here. Nursing, or at least the appearance of nursing potential. Okay. I can sometimes hear, read these articles. Oh, you know, ideals of women's beauty have totally changed over time. Fashion goes one, here and there. But I will tell you this, and I've never had a man in private conversation tell me otherwise. Every man in this room knows he could go anywhere in the world at any time and find out who the good-looking women are. Immediately. Okay. Um, hard truths, une inequalities. Okay. Women, in contrast, don't seem very interested in men who appear to have breasts. At the very least, it doesn't seem to be a feature they find. They, they, might, be, they might be not a deal breaker, but it certainly isn't number one on their list. Why? Well, obviously. But here's a feature that is not often understood in its fullness. Remember, a lot of some of these evolutionary biologists keep talking about bait, uh, you know, sex and, and pregnancy, but they forget how long it takes to get children all the way to adulthood. You want your offspring to make it. And you, they don't, they're not just going to walk up at one year old, finish nursing, and get on their own. They are deeply, terribly vulnerable. Thousands of generations. Men want to see, I'm saying again, subrationally, that the woman who's going to bear their offspring isn't going to quit when it gets hard. You do know that children are terribly difficult and annoying at times, don't you? That really is part of the deal. You have to be willing to put up with actual crap or those children will die. If your face says, I don't put up with crap, your face says, I'm leaving that kid by the side of the river. Okay, and that's something men don't want to see. They want to see the someone who's going to leave them by the side. She might, she looks like she'll do it. She looks like she just might make it through. Okay, but what about her? <laughs> she probably would drop, drop him off by the side of the river. Okay, this whole thing about men and smiles. Men are gluttons for smiles because they, their, their bodies are pro-life. Okay. I, I remember one woman, I, I did a lot of reading research. She was saying, you know, you know, these guys, they all want kindergarten teacher smiles. And I was like, there's truth to that. Because kindergarten teachers have the smiles that suggest they can put up with it. And it's not easy. Okay? If natural disposition, immediate pleasure and you know, diversion, won't make it. It won't make you through to three, four, five, six. Okay. Um, I couldn't help but resist this. In doing research for this, this book, I actually wrote a statement in there. I said, about women's interest in men. And I said, notwithstanding all you hear, you will not find any woman's romance novel, the title of which is The Listener. I want men to listen. That's not how it looks. That's not how it looks. Okay. But somebody wrote back to me and said, aha, I found one. But it, in fact, proves my point. Brooding hot guy, and she's going to make him happier or something. Men don't fantasize about that. Okay? Remember, that's what, that's what they're fearing at this part of their brain. Okay. Now, there's something else men have a problem with. This is the one that got me in a little trouble with one of my students. Most students have not got objected to. Again, men don't know the, the identity of their offspring. It's evolutionary suicide, and it's also deeply personal wounding to be tricked into being a nanny to the hot guy's kids. Okay. So, men don't want to be this. They don't want to invest in the home where all their resources are going to be going to his kids. Okay. Superman can have his own family, thank you very much. I'm told, by the way, this is one of the hottest guys ever. I, so that's why I picked that picture. Okay? Most guys know they're not like that. And even he knows he might miss a step. And there's some other guys that are like him out there. Okay. This is something that is subrational, but is a deep and a perennial problem of human life. The asymmetrical fear. The woman's fear of abandonment. The men's fear that she'll bring somebody else's child home and he'll, he'll be investing. He'll get the, and so the hot guy gets the advantage of spreading his seed as far and wide as possible. 
and he gets great intensive care for his children because he gets a nanny. He gets an extra nanny in the guy. Um, now, again, one tactic men would do would just be, okay, I'll just spread my seed as far and wide as possible. I will just practice as much of that as I possibly can, and much of that is involved in the hookup culture now. On the other hand, it's a tactic that is, has long been disfavored for two reasons. First, because women don't want men to play it that way, and they've been very eager for them not to. Secondly, every man who's got half a brain knows that every other man is trying to do the same thing. So we actually have, good, we have genetic and also um, uh, good archaeological evidence to indicate there's a lot of monogamy in the human lineage. Okay? There's a lot of bonding and breeding together. And in that respect, it's actually, I believe, it is not something that has to be socially constructed. I think men are naturally inclined in their very sexual appetites to something of a permanent bond. Okay. But, he needs something. He needs someone to give him indicia that the next hot guy who walks in the door, as hot as he is, if not hotter, isn't going to have her bodily affections too. Now you might say, but we have DNA tests and contraception now. To solve. That may all be true, and maybe that's all effective for purposes of, of sort of a rational um, Spock-like, there's Spock again, animal. But human beings are sub-rational. And we don't read emails, we read smoke signals. Okay. And the appearance, and I'll say this bluntly, the appearance of very loose unchastity gives men, the, it just freaks them out. There is no, it makes no sense to them to jump into a permanent relationship with a woman who they, have no, they don't have reason for trust in. And it's going to be the appearance. All is about appearances. That's all we can judge by. The appearance that this is, this is a woman who does not easily, at the drop of a hat, and has not done so many, many times. And this leads me to what I consider to be one of the worst romantic comedies ever made. It's the movie Pretty Woman, and it is a lie. The premise of the story is that hot guys look for brides in brothels. They don't. Okay. They don't. Um, this is the story of Cosmo, right? The, the, the Helen Gurley Brown. I can bounce from bed to bed to bed, then at 37, boom, I marry my rich, rich guy, hot guy. Okay. Does it happen? Well, I don't, the, the, not pretty woman. Can, it, can you just do a full, full tour of duty in the hookup culture for 15 years and then marry it for? It can happen. But you're seriously impairing. You, if, if, again, if, suppose you could stand and ask, tell people, all right, you've got a choice. You get the five foot or the six foot. I would tell them every time, do the six foot for the guy, okay? You're, cause, but, but you don't know where you get, the more likely than not, it's a heck of a lot easier to get married and to, and to be attractive as a potential spouse if you're doing that. It's very similar to this chastity question. Don't leave yet, okay? I know that's the hardest one. And it also, I think, is responsible for the asymmetry and the double standards. Keep in mind, men have their claims to double standard, too. Men look at the world and they say, all women have to do is show up and smile. Well, we have to be something special. Okay. Um, here's the bitter nice girl, a short story. Suppose she grows up and she's nice. She's like the contemporary world and she, and she believes in equality of men and women and she's told that men and women are the same and men and women are both, um, are both um, equal in every respect. And she likes sex, just like the nice guy likes to smile. Okay, and she goes maybe to college or high school and she's armed with this knowledge. She assumes that men are like her. So she assumes that there's a hookup, but hookups might, surely might involve a potential for a relationship. That is to say, this is a, this is a hookup designed as a, a kind of like a, a date leading to courtship and marriage. She might also assume that she doesn't find guys less attractive if they have multiple sexual partners. In fact, she might even fantasize about the guy who was once all over the place, but then converts, gets on his Harley, and rides off into the sunset with her. Okay. She would be mistaken okay. that men think the same way, just like the nice guy is mistaken. But she might think, I did what I was supposed to do. They're smiling, they're asking me, I'm saying yes, let's have sex. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. It made sense to me, they told me a story, but 
after all of this, I don't get the kind of relationship I want. In fact, I get called a slut. Okay. Or even if they don't say it, I feel it. Right. She has reason to be bitter. Okay. Maybe because she wasn't told the whole truth. That's Lena Dunham, right? Just a little parenthetical about Lena Dunham. She's a lovely girl. Everything she does is designed to obscure that fact. She's actually a performance artist. I know every man thinks Lena Dunham is, I, I knew there were pretty pictures of her out there. Almost none of them. I still, like, oh, do, 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 oh, because she's got all these pictures. She is like the anti-wife in every respect. And I think she's doing it on purpose, and maybe even maybe for good or interesting artistic reasons. Okay. Okay, let's get to the hopeful stuff. So is there any hope for us non-Mr. Darcy's? For us young women who are not virgins, who are not beauty queens. I think there's lots of hope. And here are some stubborn truths that I think might be more, more, uh, more favorable to those who are marriage-minded. First, let's not forget. Those sexes with their weird agendas and their weird issues, they're from the same place you are, not Venus and Mars. That Genesis story, whether it's true or whether it's actual, I mean, I believe it's true religiously, but I think it tells a basic truth about human beings. God did not make woman and man from different mounds of mud. That would have changed things dramatically. Okay? So one mount, there's one mountain of, there's one human race from the beginning. Okay. Um, second, everyone in this room, everyone in this room comes from an unbroken long line of winners. Some of you are Catholic will get this joke. When I was in my mid-20s and I was you know, doing one of my lamentations, I told, I told my roommate, I said, you know what, I think God's just calling me to be a consecrated loser. Okay? <laughs> That's not my heritage. It's not yours. It's highly likely that you've got substantial wherewithal to not only attract a member of the opposite sex, but find one of those members of the opposite sex tolerable to you. And that's, getting those two things at the same time is difficult, but I assure you, somehow your ancestors did this for the most part. Parenthetically, I will met, no, yes, there, there is, everyone in this room has, in their ancestry, rape, they've got accident, they've got adultery, in our, everybody in this room, and if you spread it out long enough, you find out we're all radically equal in that respect. But, there's a heck of a lot of this. Hey, you wanna go walking on the savannah? Okay. A lot of free associations that resulted in people not just hooking up accidentally, but in fact hanging out together afterwards to take care of the kids. This is in your genes, in your, deep, in your deepest part of your being. Now, it's not only an old dance, but it's highly likely that if you've been doing this thing for thousands of generations, the things you need to do aren't entirely unpleasant and may even be something you like to do. Do men kind of like to compete and kind of puff out their chest a little bit, even if they have no conscious consideration of women at the time, you better believe it. So deep is this pleasure that we take, men take pleasure in vicarious competitions. So men will spend hours watching other men show off their excellence in sports. Do women like to look pretty? In Dallas, we have annually the um, um, Mary Kay Convention. Places filled, like on the subway or the trains, filled with women. Most of them are married women. They spent an awful lot of time on their appearance. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be kind of naive to think most of them are not planning adulterous unions. They just like looking good. In fact, nine, 90, nine, 95 times out of 100, women are looking pretty and they have no thought about men. They just like to. Um, it's, it's kind of just kind of doing this makes sense. And again, vicarious beauty. Women look at beauty pageants a lot more than men do. They like looking at beautiful women. Now, some would say, well, it's all just repressed lesbianism. Or maybe it's, I like seeing excellence of this sort. Now, of course, there's not, I, I, by the way, I don't mean to suggest everyone is like this. I want to say, on average and in general, some of the stuff that the opposite sex wants from you is probably something, you, it's not like, oh, I guess I just have to you know, drill, drill a spike into my head, and that's what they find pretty, okay? It always amazes me, you know, when you talk about this, oh, fashion says, if, when I pick up things that sort of mainstream women like to wear, like Land's End catalog, that looks lovely to me, okay? It's just, there's a, there's a remarkable convergence in many respects um, between men and women's inclinations in this regard. 
I'll go even further. When I was doing the research, I read this one very coarse relationship book, but by, when, when you can kind of tell when someone's telling the truth. And so I, I actually read a lot of what her, she had to say. She was talking a lot about telling guys what they need to do, and she said, don't ever forget this. No woman wants to be thought of as a slut by the guy she's with, even if she is a slut. Those are her words, not mine, okay? But I've seen evidence of that throughout my whole life, that women, when they are attracted to a man, I don't think it's socially forced. I think there's a natural sense. I don't, I want to appear like I'm not just whatever, not, and happy whatever, not the whatever this afternoon. I think it's there. I think that's actually deeply embedded in men and women's interaction. That is to say, men and women are actually interested in giving each other the reassurances, not perfectly so, but they have inclinations to give each other the reassurances that thousands of generations of rough experience have, asked, have demanded of people. Okay. I'll take care of the kids with you. I'll show, I'll provide, be kind and strong. Yes, I promise you, the kids will be yours. Don't worry. Okay. It's like that song, Teeny Weeny Itsy Bitsy Yellow Box Dot Bikini. She was scared to come out of the water. I think what she, fundamentally what she was scared to come out of the water, she was scared to, to frighten men. <laughs> she wanted to give the impression that she was reliable. Okay, believe, and again, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, but I've had plenty of women read this and, and they have either told me the yes or no in many parts. Okay. That is to say, we kind of like doing, kind of sort of already are inclined to do what the other sex wants us to do. Okay, further, further um, good news. And I address this only to some women. I think a lot of, I, I think most women actually get this at this point, but there are some women who I think still need to hear this. I remember one time I was at, um, oh, the 24-hour fitness where I used to go. This was 20 years, 15 years ago. And I'm sitting there, you know, wrapping up. And I hear these, these three young women. It's gorgeous, okay? Like young women are. <laughs> and uh, they're all like, you know, we're, we're, just, I'm, we're just trying to look halfway, like not look totally disgusting. Like not look halfway decent. And I had another um, presentation by a woman who was um, talking to fathers a few years ago. And she said, this is, she said this was a common experience, not just hers, but others. She said when she was 16, she, you know, she looked at the, the supermodel pictures and she looked at herself in the mirror. She said, I want to get married, but my husband's going to think I look like hell. No, he's not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Men grade women on a very generous curve. Okay. That is not to say that men are egalitarians. But the vast majority of women of fertile age appear to be not, it's not a zero to 10 scale. You've already well passed, okay? And I'm gonna say there's no, oh, everyone's equal. But you're already starting from a position of enormous strength. Again, that's why men complain. Women don't have to do anything. They just show up and smile and guys like them. That's true, okay? <laughs> right? I, I, and I say this only to those who are actually, th who share those, who have those fears in the back of their heads. It's not a flip switch. It's not a 10 or, or, or Okay. If you appear to be able to survive and bear a child, you, you say something very profound and happy news to the back part of a man's mind. Okay. Now, if you look like you're going to drop dead, you're 400 pounds, okay, nobody in this room qualifies. But that, yeah, that's a different story. But it's all about offspring and education of offspring. What about, what about men? Is there anything for us non-Mr. Darcy's in the room? I can't stand that, but I see that stuff. And, and I'm already married and I'm very happy, but every time I see something, we need more Mr. Darcy's out there. Mr. Darcy, by definition, is a rare creature because he's at the top, all right? What about the average guy who's five foot nine, kind of pudgy, making 35 grand a year and will never, ever appear on the cover of the romance novel? Well, again, remember, somehow all of his ancestors made it. Well, here's the good news, gentlemen. Women offer a multiplicity of pass-fail tests. It is a pass-fail test. It's a switch, on or off. But there's multiplicity of things. If you're good at something, and this came up last in the, in the morning about, well, we need men who are equally, equally um, economically strong with women. I think that's a huge factor, but I think it can be overcome. I know some men who are significantly less economically successful than, uh, than their wives are, and they have very good marriages. Here's the deal, you gotta show some strength, and most guys are not average in everything. Almost everyone has something, and a lot of it is just faking it. And the biggest, the easiest one, by the way, you can fake is confidence. Fake it, girls like it, all right? It's like makeup, guys. Put on your makeup, and your confidence is your makeup. You might say, well, I'm tr tricking them. 
You're, no, you're doing no, nothing worse than somebody who's like a, a chef, a healthy chef. If you don't put on your makeup, all you're doing is serving the steamed broccoli and saying it's healthy, it's nutritious. Put a little delicious on there too. Put some, put some cheese on that. You're doing her a favor, okay? That's what's, of course, that's what Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. I mean, it's so much sugar there. But she gives, she puts a lot of medicine in there. That's a good, it's a good novel. It's a noble novel because it tells young women good things. But boy, I mean, it's so, at any rate, I'll talk about that some other time. Uh, the, um, the multiplicity of pass-fail tests. Find what you're good at and find out how to display it. Okay. Confidence. If you're good at fixing computers, go to the nonprofit where pretty women work and fix their computer. Do stuff like that. I'm telling you, it's like, it's like magic. The fellow that spoke this morning, uh, Dr. Price, I did have to laugh a little bit about his going on 60 dates and all this and speaking about it, which I just said, man, your world at 18 was very different from gamma male me, okay? You, I don't go choose to go on 60 dates. I, I get 60, I make 60 offers and I get two maybe. And, and, and they're just kind of sympathy dates, you know. Um, things change in life. And I'm going to tell, so if, if there are any gammas, and you know who you are, fellow gammas here in the world or betas, you guys in this room have, you might have to wait a little bit, but you have every reason for confidence. Get a job. If you're going to graduate from college, one, you know, one of the schools, not just Princeton, but any of the schools on the list, you re realize you're massively favored in these matters. You have plenty of ways to display your strength. Don't, get, don't, go, don't go to the bitter nice guy thing. You have no reason for that. It's not her fault. Instead, put some cheese on the broccoli. She wants the cheese, get her the cheese, okay? <laughs> Show a little confidence. Show a little strength of some sort. Don't focus exclusively on the physical because you think, well, I like the physical body. That, I'll spend all of my time trying to get six-pack abs. I mean, that's good if you can. They like that, okay? But there's lots of other ways to do it that might be more timely effective. And I'll say this, for purposes of marriage, you're much better pursuing a six-figure salary than a six-pack abs. Okay? Um, not only will it help the mutual attraction thing, but it's also more useful. Your six-pack abs aren't going to pay the mortgage. Um, unless you're, you know, a, a male model of some sort. But even they don't get paid very much. Men in action movies get paid a lot more than women. Women in still phot photographs get paid a lot more than men. There's reason for that. Okay. The wedding march. Is it a grease tightrope? No. Remember, you've been doing it a long time. It's not a, oh my gosh, oh, I should mention one other thing about the, the grading on a curve, the whole chastity question. It is not, just like it's not a strict supermodel or nothing, it is not a virginity test. Okay. I know many women who had boyfriends, etc., and who have very good marriages. The critical thing is not to take the two and say, well, the hell, I'll turn it into 50. It's not, and just take some time off. Men aren't worried. You don't, the fact that you, in terms of the subrational, men don't get scared about hearing a story when you're 18. They get really scared about your boyfriend two months ago who you moved in and out of and he's actually texting you now. That says, um, my baby's not, that baby's not gonna be mine. I should not, I should not be inclined in this, okay? Um, so don't, this is not, it's not a grease tightrope. It is not an absolute strict test. A lot of, there's plenty of ways you can, you can give that impression to the sub-rational part of men's desires that is the reassurance that they want, that the offspring will be theirs. Um, and just generally, it is not a strict, um, it is not a um, uh, difficult, there, there are steps to take, but it's not like you're, you're, you're either perfection or you're nothing. And I talk to men like, about this all the time. They're like, oh, women are just like, if you're not a millionaire, you're nothing. Well, there are some women who talk like that, and they're idiots. Okay, but it's not, again, it's not like you have to be perfect because then if it's perfection or nothing, you're not going to motivate anybody. People will climb hills, but they're not going to climb, you know, crazy cliffs with spikes at the bottom. They'll just go back to their video games and porn. Okay, that's all they'll do. And it's the same thing with the women, whether it's video games or whatever, just some sort of diversion. If you think marriage is, I've got to be perfect and it's all going to be, you're from a long, long line of winners, you've got the tools at your disposal. The opposite sex does not want crazy stuff from you, but they do want stuff that's not equal and the same what you want. Okay. Don't hate them for it, men, women, either way. Be a little tolerant and say, you know, I, I, I'm okay with pleasing them in the way they want to be pleased. Okay. So guys, put down your video games. Suck in your gut a little bit, get some confidence. Try to work on economics, a little bit of getting a job. 
my experience going from gamma to my 20s, initially when girls started taking interest in me, I thought they were just making fun of me. I was like in my mid-20s. I was just like, I wasn't used to it, you know. Um, I'm not saying I'm some alpha male, but, um, I mean, I have the dream marriage. I mean, my wife's gorgeous. I, I have, we have wonderful kids with wonderful life. Everything, you know, so it's like, well, had you had these dreams that they were shattered? No, these dreams, like, all came true. And I'm not anything special. And I know lots of men and women, I have many friends who have very good marriages. Um, but, I don't know, but I don't know any who totally neglected any of these things I was talking about. But will it last? If desire is as flexible, if to a certain extent you can some way make yourself attractive and attractive to somebody else, and some of it is dependent on things like youth or man's success in the job market, people have a natural fear. Will it last? I might get employed. The woman's like, well, I'm going to get old. Uh, and the man's like, well, I might, he, might, I might, he might find one of my friends is actually more successful than I am. And how, how could I possibly have, I guess I just might, must count on raw virtue. Is there anything in the subrational that is friendly to enduring mutual affection rather than just the initial courtship stage? And I think the answer is yes, if you understand the way the heart works. Human beings, and it all comes down to the choice of love. Human beings are creatures of habit. And our desires are informed by our habits. There are two things. I always tell people this. It's like a bicycle built for two. And the, and the husband and wife both have two pedals to push. The first is make a point. If, if you agree to do this, you make a point of habits of service, doing something good for your spouse. Your spouse will like you for it. And will get in the habit of liking you for it. Second, get in the habit of noticing the good things of your spouse. You want to ruin a marriage? Give both husband and wife an assignment. Spend the next six months thinking nothing bad thoughts about each other. That will turn them off. Do you understand? Because you are, you are, you're, our vision of the world is limited. So we may have a choice as to what we focus on. But if you cultivate your affection for your spouse, you make a point of saying, I need to make a point of saying and noticing good things about husband or wife. And you make a, a point of trying to please them. And both couples, I mean, gosh, it's hard to do it all the time. Okay, people are falling. But... If you all of them do it, it's a very strong marriage as a result from that. And what about the heart? I'm going to say this, and I swear to you, I'm not, some, I'm not trying to shine like a knight in shining armor. I'm telling you the truth. I tr really think my wife is the most beautiful woman in the world. I married her, and gentlemen, you can too. <laughs> How is that possible? Because I've made a point of noticing her good things. And I've seen those good things more frequently and, and, more, and over an enduring period of time, and it creates enduring attachments of your heart. And so that you do, in fact, find each other attractive. Now, I don't want to suggest it's, all, it's not all good. You have to, have to work at this because you have to make a choice not to nurse your resentments and make a choice to cherish the good things. You have to make a choice of constantly trying to serve. I think constantly. You know, you can fall down sometimes, but keep trying. And it actually does last. Okay? And I've heard this from older people, and I'm only, you know, a quarter, hopefully only a quarter of the way there. Hopefully we'll, I'm only 45. Hopefully we'll make it a lot longer. But 